Well, good morning, church family. Welcome here on this beautiful Lord's Day. We're thankful for the sunshine that God has provided and thankful for you as we are here to worship the Lord. As we begin our service this morning, I wanted to read a couple verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. All of God's rich, abundant promises that we are thankful for, that we sing through the songs we sing in church, the promises we cling to in prayer, that we have our hope and delight in, all the promises of God have their yes, their amen, in Jesus the Christ, our Savior and Lord. Praise the Lord for Jesus, our Savior. We're glad that you're here and gathered together on this Lord's Day. Would you stand with us as we sing that to our Savior? Blessed be the name of the Lord. take just a moment and mention some of the announcements on this Lord's Day as uh, so we um, our plans here as we worship the Lord together and then later on today. Well first if you are a guest with us we're thankful that you're here uh, on this on this Sunday. Um, if you've not been with us before and you're a guest with us our bulletin has been designed in a way there's a section that can be easily torn out and there's a spot there where you could record your name as well as an email address. And we would love to have record of your visit today. So if you're able to do that, you can tear that out, put that information on there, and you can put that in our offering box, which is right there in the lobby. That'll make its way to our office, and we'd love just to have a chance to be able to reach out to you in the future. Well, here today, we um, all our ministries, Lord willing, are scheduled for today. Um, our junior church will be dismissed a little bit later in our service for kindergarten through third grade. Our Awana ministry continues tonight. They're at 4.45 p.m. Youth group will be meeting together again. They're at 5 o'clock. And then tonight, a new book study begins. They're at 5 o'clock right here in the auditorium. The Praying the Bible book by Donald Whitney. Last Sunday, we had a table out with all these books. We had, again, a, a very generous gift from the publisher. Churches could, could write the publisher and get a whole case full of these books for free. So we have those and, and made those available last Sunday one copy per household. We have a few copies left, a handful of those left over. I'm glad they disappeared. That was the point. So thank you for grabbing one and taking them home. There are a handful of copies left. So if you missed that, you weren't able to get a book last Sunday. Uh, come find me after the service. I'd be happy to get one to you. Uh, we begin that study through that book. That study begins tonight there at five o'clock. Uh, have the first two chapters read. They're short chapters. I like books with short chapters. Um, they're short. They're encouragement to us. And we'll begin that study tonight by discussing those two chapters together. And speaking of book giveaways, I have some others that I would like to do here today. So, browns. I need three browns. I also need, I also need a jet. Can I have a jet? You can come up here. You guys, you can just stand right there. I'll give them to you. Okay. Um, so, that's good. I'll, I'll walk to you. 
Nice. Aren't those some handsome young men right there? Man. And that one boy, man, he's got a nice shirt on there with that baseball logo on it. All right. Well, this past year for Christmas, uh, we had our um, uh, books that we gave out to our church family uh, related to Advent by an author, Paul Tripp. Um, and I know for many of you, very much you commented to us, really appreciated that solid feedback of how much you enjoyed that Advent devotional and that you were able to go through together. Paul Tripp is a prolific author. He has many other books as well. And he also has several devotionals available, including most recently, he published a set of four of them, these four short little devotionals. They're 40 days of and then a theme. So there's 40 days on the theme of love through the scriptures, 40 days of faith, um, 40 devotionals with scripture passages to consider on faith, 40 days of grace, and then also 40 days of hope. A great little set that goes together, and again, knowing our church family is familiar with him, that you would be blessed by these. So I have these to give away. So we've got the Plinko game from uh, uh, all the game shows and all kinds of other stuff we can do together. So 40 days of love, 40 days of faith, 40 days of grace, 40 days of hope. So if you would like the 40 days of hope, raise your hand. It's going to go right back there in the blue shirt, Owen. Oops. The blue shirt right there behind the Hopkins. You can take that to him. Raise your hand. Keep your hand up. He's not going to be able to find you. There you go. Okay. 40 days of love. That one. We got right here right in the front. Okay. Ethan, you can hand it right there. 40 days of faith. 40 days of faith. A 40, uh, 40 day devotional. Hold on once. Right back there to Mrs. Frischen. Right back there. Go right back there. Right, Mr. Mark. And then 40 days of grace. Devotional on that theme. 40 days of grace. Didn't get one? Back there to Mr. Dean. So he's all the way in the back. He's got glasses on all the way in the back row where the back row Baptists sit. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Very good. We hope those will be a blessing to you. And uh, I know for many of you, um, you appreciate those recommendations and write them down. I, I saw some hands as soon as you start doing that, write them down. But those would be a tremendous blessing to you. There's, for, for all of us new in the faith or, or, or many seasons down in our faith with the Lord, we, we need helps. We need we need. Um, Good books, good resources that are going to help us to think rightly about God, help guide our prayer time, our devotional time. I know for many of you, you use the, um, our daily breads, and those have been such a blessing to you. A little devotional, some verses to think about, and I recommend those four little devotionals as well. Those would be a great blessing to you in your walk with the Lord. Well, this time, let's go to the Lord together in prayer. And today, as part of our prayer time, I would like to turn to Romans chapter 8, as a guide for this time of prayer. Romans chapter 8 is one of, is one of the most important chapters for us as Christians. Uh, along with 1 Corinthians 15, um, here in our, our, our Hebrew study, we're in Hebrews chapter 10, another one of those, those chapters that is such a blessing. And then here, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 begins after all of these chapters of truth tells us in the very first verse, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. These verses encourage us, exhort us that the goodness of God, the blessing of God that he has poured out upon us in the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation. Christian, there is no condemnation on you. The wrath of God for your sin has been poured out on Jesus. He has borne it in your place, and there is no condemnation on you anymore. So I want to use these verses as a time of pastoral prayer, of prayer of praise for the goodness of God and no condemnation. Father, we are thankful to you that this is the Lord's day. We are thankful for the beautiful day that you've blessed us. We're thankful that we can be gathered here together today. Uh, Father, thank you for you. Thank you that we know the one true God, and it is him that we worship. Father, we pray for our many friends who are not able to be with us on this Lord's Day. There's some, part, um, some folks of our church family, part of our church family, and they are um, traveling away for some extended trips, and we pray your blessing on them. We also recognize there's some folks in our church who uh, uh, may be traveling just this weekend or perhaps not feeling well. Uh, they are not able to be with us as well. So we pray for your grace upon them and your blessing. Would you lift up those who are sick and restore them to health? 
Father, today as we, as we come together in prayer, we, I just, we just want to, we want to praise you. We know we can bring all our requests before you. We know that we can bring before you those with physical need and spiritual need. But here today, we want to pause for a few minutes of, to praise you and to thank you and to glory in what you have provided for us in Jesus. Father, praise be unto you. Praise be unto the Son. Praise be unto the Spirit for the gift of salvation. Father, thank you for the plan of redemption where Jesus went to the cross and bore the wrath of God, the rightful, justified wrath of God on sinners like me. And Father, thank you that Jesus bore that wrath, making the, the atonement, the sacrifice, the payment for our sins so that we can be saved. And so that these words of Romans 8 verse 1 are eternally true. For those whose faith is in Jesus Christ alone, there is no more condemnation. Praise be to God that our condemnation has been carried away by Jesus. Just as in that day of atonement where the high priest would offer these sacrifices for the people, going through the ceremonial cleansing, the sacrifice for his own sin, and then to offer the sacrifices for the for the people of God. And so they would sacrifice this, this goat for the sacrifice. But then there also would be this goat that he'd place his hand on the head of this goat and he would pronounce the sins of the people on that goat and that goat would be led out of the camp, bearing the sins away. So Christ has borne the wrath of God away for us. There is no condemnation. There is no condemnation for us in life right now. The greatest trial we experience of life, that's as much as we'll ever experience. There is no condemnation on us. In the life to come for the believers in Jesus Christ, there is only hope and joy and eternal rest because there is no condemnation for us for those who are in Christ Jesus. Father, we rejoice and praise you for sending the Son the Son in human flesh, fully God, fully man, bearing our sins in our place, bearing our condemnation away. Father, thank you that the righteous requirement of the law, that perfection, the perfect keeping of all of God's law, we can't do it. Jesus has done, and he provides that righteousness for us, and there is no condemnation upon us. Father, thank you that in then the work of the Spirit in us, the Father's plan, the, the Son accomplishes, the Spirit works in us, works in us this understanding of who we are in Jesus, works in us this, this new faith in Jesus alone. And so we walk by faith. Our faith then starts to show up in our life in fruit and spiritual fruit and obedience to you. And it's all this work of the Spirit. And it is also this evidence, this signpost, the, the gifts that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Father, as Christians, we often experience the attack of lies from the wicked one. We experience lies and doubts in our own sinful nature, that old flesh that yet remains in us. And sometimes our flesh lies to us. It leaves you out of the equation. It leaves Jesus out of the equation and condemns us. Just as Satan would stand before you and try to condemn Job, the only reason he loves you is because you've blessed him so much. So he is the accuser, the accuser of the brethren, and he tries to condemn us. But Father, thank you that in the face of the accuser, in the face of the, the lies of our own flesh, the truth rings out eternally in Jesus there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Father, this is our hope, and we praise you for this hope. We rejoice in Jesus Christ and the hope that is ours through the gospel. Praise be to God that he has given us this hope. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. At this time, we invite you to stand with us as we continue to sing. 
as we put into song what we have prayed together. We sing mighty to save, great is thy faithfulness, and then, oh great God.
this modern hymn, O great God of highest heaven, occupy my lowest heart. The final verse says, help me now to live a life because of what Christ has done, because of the no condemnation in him, so we want to live in obedience to him. Let's sing this together, our final song this morning. Father, thank you for these songs that we, we sing. We sing them out with joy. We sing them out thoughtfully because we, be, we want to believe what we're singing as we testify of the truth of the blessed, the glory be the name of Jesus. Our God is mighty to save to the uttermost. Um, he, is, he is worthy of praise, all praise to him. He's faithful. Glory, how great is our God. So Father, thank you that we could sing these songs together. Father, now as the, as the scriptures are read for us on this Lord's Day, as our children in just a moment will be dismissed to junior church, we ask, Father, for your blessing, your blessing on your word as it is read and preached today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and at this time, our children, kindergarten through third grade, may be from Genesis chapter 50, uh, verses 15 through 26. And if you've got a few Bible in front of you, you can find that on page 41. <clears throat> when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that jo Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of, of your father. Joseph wept, and when they spoke to him, his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. 
But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I am in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about the many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones, thus be com comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph remained in Egypt, and he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw uh, Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children also of Machir and the son of Manasseh, were counted to Joseph as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up for this land to the land that he swore to Abram, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you. You, will, you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you. We praise you because you are the only loving God that reaches out to everybody uh, within this world. We also praise you for giving us the freedom to read these scriptures without being without being um, frowned upon, made fun of. These scriptures reaches out to every corner of the world and as of today they are reaching every corner of this church. Be with Pastor Sam as he brings forth these messages and open up our hearts that whatever he may preach, that uh, the, the word of God will go through your heart and in your mind that you may become one of his servants. In God's name said, amen. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> well, again, good morning to you. I'm thankful to um, worship together. Amen. It's a blessing to be together to worship the Lord. Last Sunday, we took a break from our study through of the storyline of the scriptures to consider a specific theme, a specific topic there of revival versus revivalism. And now here today, we're back to this study. Uh, this study is tracing the mountain peaks, tracing the storyline of the Bible. Our theme for this year is know the word. We want to know the Bible, we want to know the scriptures, we want to understand here how the scriptures fit together as they're one unified whole, but then also, as John's gospel exhorts us, we want to know the word, that is Christ, Jesus. We want to know Jesus himself, our Savior. Well, we've been tracking this storyline of the Bible together for a while. We can understand this storyline through four key words, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. We really can summarize the entire Bible story with those four words. There's much more, but we can summarize it in that way. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. And from the earliest chapters of the Bible, God begins to lay out a path through themes, events, repeated details sometimes. There's some breadcrumbs distributed, if you will, and they all lead us to Jesus. So all of our favorite stories, creation, Noah and the flood, the Tower of Babel, Abraham, Joseph, the Exodus, David and Goliath, Elijah calling down fire from heaven, the stories of Daniel and on. They all are on this path of God's progressive revelation of himself and his plan. The Bible tells God's story to us. And that story is founded upon, it's centered on, Christ Jesus the Lord. So here this year, we're taking this, this bird's eye view, the forest view of the scriptures. We're wanting to know what is the central story that God's telling through the Bible. And so then where do we fit in that story? And what I'm arguing for is that the great mountaintop peaks in the Bible, these pinnacles throughout the Bible, they are what teach us, guide us to this great storyline. And those mountain peaks are where God enters into a covenant with his people. So those covenants include God's covenant with Adam, with Noah, Abraham, with Moses, that is the giving of the law, with David, and then the new covenant, made with the redeemed. So we're following the ridge line that the Bible lays out itself. 
The Bible determines the path. It's not a theological system imposed on the scriptures, but tracking the Bible's grand story as the Bible tells it. That's what we're wanting to do. So today, today is one of those in-between Sundays. So we aren't looking at a mountaintop. We're more that valley space in between a mountaintop. The last time we were together in this series, we considered God's covenant with Abraham, one of the highest of all the mountain peaks, continuing, continuing to have ramifications all through the New Testament. Next time, we'll consider the exodus of God's people, certainly one of these mountaintop moments in the Bible. Today, we're going to consider those years in between. The space of God's fulfilled promise of a son to Abraham and Sarah, all the way to Jacob and his 12 sons, then living in Egypt. So how does the storyline of the Bible move from one mount, massive mountain peak to another? And more importantly, what do we learn about God in this space? So today, I hope you have your comfy seat. We're going to be here for a while. No, no. We're going to preach all the way through all these chapters. It's very much survey style, bird's eye view, just checking out from the forest, the forest view level. But from Isaac to Egypt, all these chapters, Genesis 21 to 25. We begin then first with Isaac. With Isaac, God provides the son of promise. Isaac. God provides the son of promise. There's a much of the scriptures we won't be able to read together today. I tried to include some chapters. I'll make mention of some specific verses as we go. There'll probably be some that we look at, but just dealing with the bulk that we have, we won't be able to read a great deal here today. A little outside of my comfort zone with that, to be honest. Well, we begin here with then Isaac. God provides the son of promise. We learn the story of Isaac in Genesis 21 through 24. He shows up at other places too, but this is, these are the essential chapters for him. And first, there is the birth of the promised son. We see this in chapter 21, if you're looking there. It's verses 1 through 7. I just want to read uh, just a little bit here. I'll just read those. Then the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. The Lord God did to Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, who Sarah bore him, Isaac. If you have footnotes or um, those notes in your Bible, footnotes, you might want to look, you look down at that. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. After waiting 25 years from God's first promise to fulfillment, the son is born to this 100-year-old man, Abraham and his wife Sarah. Isaac is born. And what's his name mean? It means laughter. That capturing the moment when Sarah first heard the angel's words that in a year she would bear a son, Sarah had laughed. She laughed. Well, why did she laugh? Well, why do you laugh? We usually laugh when we think something is funny. And it might be true that there's some unbelief in Sarah's laughter. He addresses it. Sarah certainly responds a little fearful. But it's, it's simply funny. Sarah you are going to give birth to this boy. Sarah is in her 90s, and the thought of her bearing and giving birth to a son with Abraham is an impossibility. So she laughed. It's good and okay to laugh. And the joy of holding this baby boy now, that indeed produced more laughter and joy over that. So they named this boy Isaac, meaning laughter. I think just a praise the Lord for babies. Amen? Praise the Lord for whole and healthy pregnancies and deliveries. Praise the Lord for chubby baby cheeks and chubby baby toes. Praise the Lord for life. Praise the Lord. And this couple, Abraham and Sarah, they are rejoicing at the birth of this boy. And praise the Lord for the fulfillment of God's promise. 
all of God's covenant promises to Abraham to make him into a great nation, to have kings come from him, all the world's going to be blessed through Abraham. The first step of that is this baby boy that they hold. The golden thread of God's redemptive plan proceeds from Adam to Seth to Noah to Shem to Abraham and now this baby boy Isaac. So praise the Lord. Then we come to Genesis 22, and there is a sacrificial test of the promised son. Then, at the highest of joys, God comes and says this. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early and did as God instructed him. God brings a test to Abraham. This very son of promise, God now asks Abraham to sacrifice him? How can this be? If you know the story, you know how it goes. They go to the place God instructs. They, they walk up there. Abraham binds Isaac. He places them on the altar. He raises the knife to offer his son. And God calls out to stop. Look down in 22 verses 12. Verse 12, he said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him there was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. Abraham went, he takes the ram, he offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. Many of you know this name, of what this name is. It's Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. And on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. He brings this test. This was a test of Abraham's faith. Hebrews tells us that Abraham believed that God could raise Isaac back from the dead. Hebrews 11, verse 19. But in Isaac's place, God provides this ram as a substitute for Isaac so that Abraham and Isaac may worship the Lord together. And note that it's on the mount where God provides this. Well, many want to water down this passage with applications how God calls us to personal sacrifice. And maybe there's some application we made there. That's not the real point of Genesis 22. The point of this story is to point to the Messiah. It's to point to Jesus. Where God the Father will offer his one and only son as a sacrifice. But in Jesus' place, there will be no substitute. Jesus is the substitute. And on that mountain, the son will be sacrificed on a cross of wood, paying the penalty for our sins, the graphic test here for Abraham, which tugs at our hearts, it reveals the heart of God. He offers his one and only son, Jesus, for you, so that you may receive forgiveness of sins, new life, walk down that mountain with God. Truly, God has provided himself the sacrifice. God provides for redemption. A third scene here for Isaac, this son of promise, is chapter 24. Well, Isaac, he's mentioned again elsewhere. It's chapter 24. is kind of the final scene where it's mainly about him. So Abraham, in this scene, in this chapter, he sends his servant back. It's this, it's this awkward promise thing. He has his servant place his hand under his thigh and swear to him, we don't do this today. My dad never did that. Son, I want you to be home at this time. Place your hand under your thigh and swear to me under my thigh. Swear. They haven't done that. That'd be a little weird. But it's how they did this and marked this as a, as a promise, a promise to do this. And so he makes this promise. He returns back to Abraham's homeland, back to Ur. And as he goes there, he is directed. He wants, he's trying to find a wife for Isaac. The servant prays about this. And, and God, would you, would you make my path straight in this way? And God does that. And he comes along and he finds Rebecca. Rebecca, uh, her brother Laban, he's going to show up in this story also. She agrees to go with the servant. She travels back to where Isaac lives and she becomes Isaac's wife. God's instruction 
to be fruitful and multiply. Can Isaac fulfill that on his own? No, regardless of what society wants to tell us right now. No, he cannot. He needs a wife. He needs a loving wife and that marriage union together, one man and one woman for a lifetime. The promise of a great nation from Abraham, it cannot be fulfilled without families. And Rebecca joins this family line. And she does so with great faith. Time es escapes us right now to really jump into that and consider the faith that she has. She returns, marries Isaac, and God's promises march on. In the story of Abraham to Isaac, what do we learn about God? God provides the son of promise. Do you see how Isaac is pointing to Jesus? He serves as this picture, this pattern that's revealed more fully in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the true son of promise. Jesus is the one and only beloved son sacrificed by the father. Jesus is given a bride, the church, the object of his affection. The story of God providing the son of promise is revealed in the grand story as a signpost, as shadow, as theme to point us down that we would recognize the Messiah, that's Jesus. That's Jesus Christ the Lord. So first, and as a summary, this, we're getting between the mountain peaks here today. The first is Isaac. God provides the son of promise. Number two, number two, Jacob. God sanctifies his chosen son. Jacob, God sanctifies his chosen son. For this portion of the story, Jacob occupies a much larger section. He is mentioned again, just as the, as the scripture passage was read this morning. He's mentioned through the rest of Genesis, but really his key scenes are here 25 through 36. So Jacob, God sanctifies his chosen son. Look with me. We'll turn to, I may not be able to read any of these, but Genesis 25, verses 19 through 26. Genesis 25, verses 19 through 26, the story of Jacob's birth. And I titled this, I don't have this up on the, the screen behind me, but in my outline as I look at this, I titled this, A Brother Cheater is Born. No amens. Nobody utter any amens thinking of your own family. A brother cheater is born. Many of families have been destroyed by a, well, a poorly timed monopoly game. Right? A brother cheater is born. To Isaac and Rebekah is born twin boys. Twin boys. And as usually true among siblings, the fighting begins early. But this is even a more unusual. As the twins are born, the younger is born holding on to the heel of his brother. His name Jacob, which means he who grabs the heel or he who cheats. That's quite the name. This is, uh, this is my son, and this is son, it's he who cheats. The scripture reveals that when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau. He ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Chapter 25, verses 27 and 28 tell us. Do you see some trouble brewing here? already the favoritism between mom and dad the the competition between boys already the favoritism and cheating it appears in two key scenes the older esau he trades his birthright to the younger jacob for a bowl of soup and then under his mother's instruction jacob tricks his blind father into giving the firstborn blessing to him esau is left with the scraps how aptly named G Jacob is. Because of this, as we flip forward to chapter 28, this brother deceiver, he is sent away. Because of this that happened, Esau's in a rage. He's going to kill his brother. It makes it known. Rebekah tells Isaac about this. Rebekah says, Isaac, you've got to send Jacob away. Send him back to my family, lest his brother kill him. So Isaac does that. He instructs his son. He continues the promise to him, the blessings he's given to him. The covenant blessings of Abraham to Isaac, they're now going to Jacob, this chosen son Jacob. They're not going to Esau, the older son. And Jacob is sent away, and he returns home. 
In Genesis 28, 1 to 5, we have this being sent away. And then chapter 10, verse 22, we have this as Jacob is making his way back to his mother's homeland. He has this vision of the Lord. He has this vision of steps or a ladder ascending up to heaven and descending. And the angels are going up and going down. And he has this vision. He hears this word of the Lord. And he receives the promise extended to him. Lest we wonder, there's a mistake here. Uh, you know, Isaac, you got this wrong. The covenant blessing isn't going to go to Jacob. It goes to, it goes to Esau. You gave it wrong. No, God continues this. It was God's will for this covenant promise to go to Esau. And he re God himself repeats it. Well, before this, he, he's here, he responds, he wakes up in the morning and he worshiped the Lord, but he makes a, this pitiful statement. He's just been given the covenant promises that God gave to his grandfather Abraham. Look at verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid, and he says, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Early in the morning, he takes the stone, he makes a place there to worship. And then he says, verse 20, Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then... The Lord shall be my God. Wait a second. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. Jacob, God is preserving your life. Jacob, God has just extended to you the covenant promises that are going to bring the Redeemer and he thinks he's big stuff to offer to God 10% of what he gives him, or a rock to be God's house. Is Jacob really getting it yet? Is Jacob really understanding what's going on? We find Jacob, he needs some sanctification. He needs some change. And often God is, God is absolutely always willing to bring that sanctification our way, and often is the case, God's willing to bring sanctification our way through that old school of hard knocks. And so we see with Jacob, verse, chapter 29 to 31, a brother laborer receives his own medicine. He gets back his own medicine. Most of us, in the process of learning humility, and how many of you have learned humility? Do not raise your hand. <laughs> Most of us in the process of trying to learn humility, we're pretty thick-headed about that, aren't we? It's, uh, we? We only really learn it the hard way, right? That's what's true for me. Think about it. It took Samson getting his hair cut off and his eyes gouged out for him to begin to learn it. It took Jonah being swallowed by a giant fish. And for Mr. Cheat Jacob, it takes a more skilled cheat, his uncle Laban, to begin process of humbling him i got to summarize so much here, but the story goes like this. Jacob gets back there and kind of reminiscent, um, a mirror to how um, his own mother was, was found through the servant. He goes back and he sees this girl, Rachel, and he, he finds the home of Laban he's supposed to look for, and he immediately is smitten, just smitten, love at first sight with Rachel. Now remember, Jacob is a man. Is he used to getting his way? He is. He can connive, he can work things out, he can get what he wants. He knows how to manipulate people and work people. So he has an agreement. He thinks, ooh, my Uncle Laban, I'm going to sweet talk him into this, and I'm going to marry this young lady. She's very pretty. I'm going to marry her. So the agreement is seven years of labor. Jacob thinks, hey, that's of no small thing. I can do that. So Jacob... He has inherited the stewardship of God's covenant with Abraham. He's been given the blessing of land in the promised land, but now he gladly becomes a slave laborer to his uncle Laban. Well, Laban, he agrees with that, with a smile and a handshake and arm around his shoulder. But on the wedding night, he switches Rachel with, his older, with the older sister, Leah. In the morning, Jacob can't believe it. In the morning light, he's dumbfounded, he's amazed. The deceiver has been deceived. 
Laban then gives Rachel as well in marriage to Jacob in exchange for seven more years of labor. He works seven years. He finally marries Rachel. It's a switch. Waits a week. He marries Leah. And then he works for a whole nother seven years. Well, God blesses Jacob with abundance. And Laban notices. The gloves come off in this family mess. And Laban tries to cheat Jacob out of what he has in the, in the, in the flocks. But God works in Jacob's, beha- Jacob's behalf. Remember, God's covenant blessing is with Jacob, and Jacob even just grows all the more, even as Laban tries to cheat him. So Jacob finally, through a series of events, he departs in the night. He has secretly escapes his two wives, two concubines, and 11 boys, plus daughters, and they all leave. Jacob had trusted Laban, kind of, but was met with manipulation and deception. Hey, Jacob, have you done that to anybody else? You know, sometimes God lets us come face to face with the same hurt that we have caused in others. And God doesn't do that to destroy us, to crush us. He does that so that we could learn humility and we could learn repentance. Is God working in your life in that way today? Is there a hurt you're experiencing? And if you'll take that before the Lord, maybe a lesson God has for that. Maybe not, but maybe a lesson God has for that is some humility. That same hurt you're experiencing, maybe you've caused that to somebody else and need to make that right. The story for Jacob, it doesn't end here, but it, it really concludes. It's one of its greatest scenes is here in chapter 32 into, the, into chapter 33. In chapter 32, we have a brother worshiper. He meets the Lord. This last scene for him, major scene for him, it's the night before he returns home with all this abundance with his wives, his children. He's going to see Esau again. Remember, what did Esau think of Jacob last time they were in the same place? He wanted to kill him, right? And he's worried about this. He makes this big plan, and it's the night before Jacob meets God. In Genesis 32, verse 24, And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. This would be a a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. The Son of God is here with Jacob. He meets God face to face. This is likely God the Son. In the strange encounter, Jacob clings for his life and begs for God's blessing. And in the end, he receives it. His whole life has been clinging to himself and his own wants. Will the chosen son, not Esau, it's Jacob, will the chosen son cling to God alone now? And finally here in this scene, we see Jacob doing that. His name is changed from Jacob to Israel. And he is blessed by God and he worships Finally, this son, this deceiver, this cheater, this manipulator, he now clings to God. He's learned some humility, and his name has changed. To summarize, once again, the Bible's grand storyline is leading us forward, isn't it? God promised to send a snake crusher who would one day make all things right. The kingdom was first established in Eden, but it was lost in sin. But it's going to be made anew. And the deliverance of this promise would be done under God's protection to never destroy the world again by a flood. It comes by means of God's command to fill the earth, to multiply in it, to rule over it. And God's promise is going to come through Abraham to make of him a great nation. That is, all the nations of the world will be blessed. From Abraham to Isaac and not to Esau but to Jacob, now changed to Israel. God has sanctified his chosen son, as Romans chapter 9 makes clear, it is not his choice of Esau. He purposely does not choose Esau. He chooses his covenant blessing upon Jacob. That's what God promised to do. A third scene in between mountain peaks as we're tracing this story. We're seeing God's action, his doings, his gracious accomplishing of his plan. Third, Joseph. God preserves his covenant people. Joseph, 
God preserves his covenant people. We didn't do this this morning. I didn't ask this question. But if I had asked this morning, maybe a little small little card and write down who, who are a couple of your favorite Bible characters? Who are a couple of your favorite Bible stories? There is no doubt in my mind on many of those cards, Joseph is going to show up on that list. There's, we love this story of Joseph. Um, uh, years ago, uh, um, let's see, that was, I think just Alyssa and I, we were with a group of students on a special trip, and we were at Sight and Sound Theaters. I don't know if you've heard of Sight and Sound Theaters or been to there, and we saw a special production of the story of Joseph and his life, and it was so moving and powerful. We love this story here of Joseph. Well, in a survey form, what, how, how does Joseph fit in the grand story? There's a lot more to learn about Joseph, but how does he fit in this? Well, we begin with Joseph, dreams and familiar danger. Under this Joseph, dreams and familiar danger. So let's just back up and think about this family that Joseph is born into. So Jacob has his two wives. He has two concubines, or as kids, we'd always say cucumber vines. I've heard it said both ways. It could be that too. So Jacob, now he's named Israel, he lives in a portion of the promised land. He has a favorite son who's named Joseph. And why is Joseph his favorite son? Because he is the son of Rachel. So that's his favorite son. He's the oldest of his favorite wife, Rachel. Rachel had died while giving birth to a second son. You might recall his name, Benjamin. Well, Jacob knows the pain of family favoritism, so he stays clear of that, right? No. He commits the same thing with his own boys, Joseph being that favorite son. And needless to say, Joseph's brothers hate him. And then his father, what's that famous gift he gives to his son Joseph? That special expensive cloak of many colors that he has. When Joseph begins to conduct himself as better than his brothers, he has these dreams of greatness, and he's more than happy to tell them of his dreams of greatness. He's more also a tattletale with his brothers. His brothers decide they've had enough. And one day, far from home, they strip Joseph of this cloak and they throw him in a pit, deciding that they're going to kill him. It's not until eventually they sell him uh, to, of all people, some Ishmaelites. That first son of that conceived idea of Abraham. The Ishmaelites then take and they sell him into slavery, slavery in Egypt. By the way, this is going to come out again here this morning. It was his brother Judah that suggested they sell him into slavery. It's that, son, it's that brother Judah, the fourth son of Leah. So do you see a signpost here? Like Joseph, was Jesus, Jesus sold for some silver? He was betrayed by his brothers unto death. Joseph was reported to his father as dead, and in one sense, Joseph was dead, his life over from that day on. Jesus betrayed unto his death. But while there is those dreams and familiar danger, there's also danger and familiar dreams. For the rest of the life, no matter the events to come, Jesus, Joseph is going to live out the rest of his life a slave in Egypt. There's some redemption story we're going to see in Joseph, but he is still a slave. He can't leave Egypt. He first, he's in this house of Potiphar, and then later in Pharaoh's own home. He is accused of wrongdoing, which he didn't do there in Potiphar's house. He's thrown into prison. He'll remain there in prison for many years, rising in authority and responsibility, until God's gift of understanding and interpreting dreams brings him face to face with Pharaoh himself. God brings all the pain in this man's life together for a first step of good. By the grace of God, Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams. There's going to be seven years of plenty, right? Then there's going to be seven years of famine. We need to store up food in the good seven years so we will have enough in those seven bad years. And through this interpretation and wisdom, Joseph is resurrected out of that jail restored to life out of prison, and he is made the second in command over all of Egypt. He now sits at the right hand of Pharaoh. He marries, he has two children, two boys. And then the last scene we have of Joseph, 
we get now into chapters 46 and onward, there's a chance for vengeance, but then also a chance for more. The famine comes, and so does everyone in the region to Egypt to buy grain. This really was a time in human history when Egypt rose in power as they are selling all this grain, and they gain land, they gain cattle, they gain so much of their power. And so do, who else comes? Joseph's brothers show up all these years later. It's interesting that they don't recognize Joseph, but he recognizes them. Through a series of events, Joseph works through his pain, his sorrow, his opportunity for forgiveness, or opportunity for vengeance, and he forgives. He forgives his brothers. I love this scene. I have to stop for a second and point it out. It's chapter 46, 28 through 30. As he reveals himself to his brothers, they're terrified, and they, they can't believe it. And he just says, I'm Joseph, your brother. Is my father alive? I'm Joseph, your brother. Is my father alive? And they're so scared they can't answer it. Finally, they can answer, and they say, yes, yes, he's still alive. And so he sends the brothers back with these wagons to bring them back. And when Isaac, or excuse me, when Israel, Jacob, Israel, he first gets word, Dad, Joseph is alive. He's in Egypt. He's who we saw. Joseph is alive. He can't believe it. It knocks him down, and he has to sit down. It takes seeing all the wagons and all the supplies for him to, this is enough. My son is alive. I will go and see Joseph. In chapter 46, down in verse 28, and Jacob um, lived in the days, let's see, I'm in the wrong spot, 20, over here. He sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to show the way before him in Goshen, and they came into the land of Goshen. Then Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, in Goshen. He presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Israel said to Joseph, now let me die, since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. This father and this son restored together again in this beautiful scene. Because of God's work in Joseph, in spite of even through the great sin committed against him, the passage kind of laid out there that Mark read for us, God preserves his people. The people of Israel are now there in the land of Egypt, Remember, this is exactly what God promised to Abraham. He told Abraham this back in Genesis 15, verses 13 and 14. This would happen. So to summarize, God preserves his covenant people. He swore on himself, passing alone through those divided animals in Genesis 15. You remember that? He guaranteed the fulfillment of this. God will see his promises through. God preserves his people. Friends, in the great storyline of the Bible, God will see his redemptive plans through all the way to the end. There's one last scene in Genesis 49. This is the shortest of all of them. The concluding point from Isaac to Egypt. And it's Genesis 49. It's fourth, Judah, God reveals his future king. Judah. God reveals his future king. Here in Genesis 49, we're at the last scene for Jacob, now named Israel. And here, as he sits before you, he has all his sons before him, Joseph's two boys, the inheritance actually goes down to them, and he has, this, he has words of blessing, sometimes curse, to these, these boys. Um, there's an old youth pastor's line shared with parents at those youth parent meetings. I won't believe everything your teen says about you if you don't believe everything your teen says about me. It's a good line to repeat often in youth ministry. But while you took what you hear, with, while, while we try to take what we hear with a grain of salt, there's some truth. Families always know the truth about the family. And in Jacob, now Israel's final words of blessing to his sons, all the skeletons come out of the closet. Things that the family hasn't really talked about, things that have kind of been swept under, it all comes out, the good and the ugly. How powerful final words are. But what does he say, looking at verses 8 through 12, 49, Genesis 49, verses 8 through 12. 
Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hands shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion, as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be obedience of the peoples. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine and his vestures in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. With all the ground we've sprinted through today, we've gotten in this helicopter, we've, we've flown over the forest to see all this bird's eye, view, bird's eye view. With all that we've worked through, where do you expect those promises of Abraham to go? Abraham? Isaac? We'd expect Jacob, but it's not Jacob, it's Esau. Where do you expect the promises to go next? It's Joseph, right? We expect if there's any of these scoundrel brothers, Benjamin maybe, I mean, he was younger, so he st kind of stayed out of it, but certainly it'd go to Joseph. But that's not what God does. God extends the promises that he is going to fulfill this great snake crusher, and he does it through Judah. It will be through Judah's descendants. And we learn something else here. It's not just a provider is going to make all things new. It's not just a substitute sacrifice like those skins God made for Adam and Eve. But this deliverer, he's going to be a king. He's going to be a ruling, conquering king. Of the tribe of Judah will come the Messiah to make all things right, to be the substitute sacrifice, the one and only of the Father, and that conquering king. And friends, we know where the story goes. That conquering king is Jesus. So conclusion today, from the garden through the flood unto one man from Ur to his grandson to a specific clan, God is carrying forth and accomplishing his eternal plan of redemption. This plan, this is the storyline of the Bible. God is revealing the truth about himself, the truth about sin, the truth about salvation, the truth about glorious rest in the eternal kingdom. We can trace the line. Adam, Abel, Seth, Noah, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah. Or the themes we've been learning, creation, kingdom, covenant, fall, and promise. These four scenes today, this space in between two major mountaintops, they teach us the gospel. God has provided a sacrifice. God chooses the sacrifice his own. God preserves the people he saves. And God provides a conquering king. All of this story points us to Jesus he is the chosen son who provides our sanctification. God will preserve us through faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus is our conquering king. May our prayer together be, all glory be to the Father. All glory be to the Son. All glory be to the Spirit. In power, three in one. If you could have heads bowed and, and eyes closed just for a moment. As God's word has been preached this morning, as we have explored a great section of the Bible, seeing God's faithfulness, seeing God's fulfillment of his plan, seeing how the, can, these points through the scriptures connect to the grand story, how has God spoken to you? In just a moment, the room will be quiet. We're not going to call on anybody. We're not going to point anybody out. But as God's word has been preached, all people must respond. That's you and that's me. So I'll give you the quietness of these moments right where you're seated. Talk with God. Respond to him in prayer. And then I will pray.
Father, thank you for the scriptures and thank you for the revealing of your redemptive plan. Thank you, Father, for the Bible. We can trace along and see God's work and see your hand. It's all unto your glory, revealing your greatness and your goodness and your power and your majesty, your wisdom and your perfections, your grace and your mercy. Father, thank you. Thank you that for our salvation in Jesus, the promised one, the snake crusher, the sacrifice, the one and only son, the king who conquers. Thank you that we know by faith who is this one? Who is this king of glory? The Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is the king of glory. Father, as we conclude our service in just a moment by singing the doxology together, I pray that we, we would praise you. We would praise you for your wisdom and your might and your power and the goodness of your plan and faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen.